Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary with the Get Some Podcast. And my guest this week is... <laughs> this motherfucking Gary. <laughs> Hey, what's up, everybody? This is uh, Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. As always, let's start with my schedule. This weekend, I am in Jacksonville, Florida at the Comedy Zone. That's May 17th to the 19th. Uh, four shows. Well, Friday and Saturday sold out, so Sunday's still available. We just added a 4 p.m. show on Sunday uh, in Jacksonville. So I say May 17th to the 19th, but really May 19th is all that's left. Um Still debating whether we want to do a third show Saturday. We'll see. I don't know, but we definitely had a second one Sunday. And then next week, uh, May 23rd to the 26th, I'm in Addison, Texas at the uh, Improv. Uh, I believe one show's already gone, so that's Addison's always good. Dallas is always good. Eh, no wrong with Dallas. And then May 29th, I'm in Omaha, Nebraska at the Funny Bone. May 30th, I'm in Des Moines, Iowa. At the Funny Bone, and then May 31st through June 2nd, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. At the Funny Bone, used to be the Improv, now it's the Funny Bone. And then I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, June 7th through the 9th at the Stardome. And then Father's Day weekend, June 14th through 16th, I'm in Chicago and Schaumburg at the Improv. And June 21st through 23rd, I'm in Oklahoma City at Bricktown Comedy Club. And then May 28th, I'm sorry, June 28th through the 30th, I'm in Miami at the Improv. I think that's the Dania Beach Improv. Um, yeah, Jacksonville's this weekend. I remember one time I was in Jacksonville when Calais Campbell played there, the defensive lineman. I remember he picked me up, and then we got something to eat. And then when we were going to eat, these cop cars just start flying by us. Wow, wow, wow. We're like, what is going on? And we were like making a joke. Like uh, somebody got arrested. I don't know. We were joking around. We see that many cop cars coming. Well, we didn't realize that it was when that shooting happened. They had that that video game tournament and a big shooting happened. A guy came in and shot up a, people, a bunch of people playing video games. And we couldn't because Jacksonville is a bunch of bridges. We could we cross over the bridge to get some lunch. We couldn't come back. They shut like downtown down. Let me see what year that was. That was uh Jacksonville land. I think it's the Jacksonville Landing. Jacksonville Landing. I think shooting. I'm trying to remember what year that was. August 26, 2018. Dang, was that long ago? Yeah, the Jacksonville Landing shooting, also known as Jacksonville shoot, was a mass shooting that occurred at a video game tournament for Madden 2019, August 26th at 1.30 p.m. A lone gunman, David Katz, shot and killed two people and injured another teen before, and, and injured another 10 before killing himself. So yeah, Calais came to get me for lunch, so 1.30, and he must have been in training camp. And... uh so it had to be a Saturday or Sunday. You know what? Just so you guys know, I'm accurate in my storytelling. Uh, what is 2018? It was a Sunday. Yep. I knew it. Boom. <laughs> so I don't know why I got so much joy out of that. But uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's funny, like, as comedians and I think any entertainers that travel or anybody travels a lot, whenever you go back to cities, there's always, if I've been going to cities for 20 plus years now, there's, there's always those, the one time you went, you remember this happened. Like for Jacksonville, I'll always remember that shooting because we could not cross the bridge. They shut downtown down. And my hotel room looked dead at the landing. I mean, it was right there. So it was like, all weekend they shut down. They shut it down for the well. I left Monday, but they shut it down the rest of the day. So all I saw was the yellow tape and police cars everywhere and the investigation. It's weird how you just remember 
the most random things when you go to cities? Um, what is this? Where, where are we at? May? Yeah. Uh, so, hold on. Yeah, Jacksonville. That was that's probably the the one thing I remember the most about Jacksonville and Duval leaving me on his airplane, which which didn't happen. That was a joke. Uh, so, I guess the, the a couple of things I want to address this podcast is to to piggyback off last week's Club Shay Shay, which we're almost at three million views. So uh, that was I thought that would be for that podcast. I was like, that'd be good if we got three million. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy with the numbers. Obviously, you want you'd want more. Uh, anybody wants more? We sell a thousand tickets. You want to sell a thousand and one tickets? You got three million viewers. You want four million? So, we're right around three million, just under as I record this. So, uh, yeah, it was a successful podcast, and it's so powerful. Like, I, it, it, Shannon sent me a DM. Just thanking me for coming on and being vulnerable and all the other stuff. And then I was just like, I messaged it back. I said, yeah, man, thanks for having me. I said, you've really become, quote, unquote, that show. You're that show that moves the dial. That <clears throat> deep down, everyone wants to, wants to get on it. Now, I don't think someone like Chappelle or Kev or, or, or Jamie Foxx or somebody like that, I don't think they're tripping. They're good. But someone at my quote unquote level or around there. I mean, why wouldn't you want to go on this podcast? It's just those numbers and there's no such thing as bad press, especially in our line of work. So yeah, but there was a couple stories I want to piggyback on that I really didn't get to last week or this week. One was about this, uh, this case that I brought up real briefly, this guy named Joe Carlini. So just to give a backstory right in the middle of my divorce, all of a sudden, I'm getting sued by this guy, Joe Carlini, who said that he got my email from a friend of mine. He sent me an email that had a script and I guess a movie idea for what men want, which if people remember what men want, that was a remake of what women want from Mel Gibson back in like the early 90s, late 80s. And Tarazi starred in it. Will Packer produced. It was a Paramount movie. The only reason I remember that movie is because I auditioned for it. I auditioned for like four different roles and didn't get any of them. And then Will, I remember Will called me. He goes, yeah, man, they just, they don't, the director doesn't feel like you're right for any of the parts. And then when I saw the movie, I go, oh my God, there were so many white dudes that had like small parts. And I was like, but see so your hand over there. Uh, but I, that's why I remember that movie so much. Cause I remember I auditioned for four different roles. So then this guy sues me. He says, I basically, long story short, he gave me a movie. I, he, I read the email. I must have told this email and this gave this script to Will Packer. So he then made it a movie. And this Joe Carlini wanted a compensation for quote unquote stealing his idea. And my thing was, how did I get in this? I wasn't in the movie. I was not a producer. It was not a created by. I got no monetization. I made no money off this movie. I'm not affiliated with it in any way possible other than I auditioned for it. And so the fact that he sues me and at the end of the day, completely innocent. I was vindicated. The problem is, and this is the problem with, I don't know, the ju judicial system when it comes to this type of stuff. I still lost because it cost me $110,000 to fight this case over two and a half years. And this is all in the middle of my divorce. So not only am I fighting my divorce, got attorney fees coming in. I got attorney fees coming in from this frivolous lawsuit. And I remember I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about it so bad. And then my lawyers was like, nope, nope, not until it's completely thrown out. You don't want to say anything. You don't want anybody coming after you or nothing. So now that it's completely done, Case was thrown out. I am completely vindicated. Now I can talk about it. So Joe Carlini, let me say his name again. Just be careful around this guy. And the, the sad part is like, you know, Will was named in it, Will Packer, Paramount. But they got big lawyers that can fight their case for them. Uh, and I'm sure Paramount fought for Will. 
But I couldn't even bring up the Will. I saw Will back in like, I've seen him like two, three times since this cases came up. And I never brought it up because you're listening to your attorneys. They're like, don't bring it up the Will. Don't say nothing because you don't want anything to come back in court that you two conspired and said anything. So I'm going, all right. But sometimes I wonder like, if I would have just ignored it, would it have just gone away? Or would I have really lost money in this? Because I don't know how I don't know, you're going the advice of your lawyer. I have an entertainment attorney. So then he got me in contact with a, a law firm that could fight this for me. And at the end of the day, they did their job. It's just I'm the one out. I'm the one out. I'm like, so now we got to go to Paramount and ask which I doubt is going to happen. Hey, can you help me out? <laughs> can you can you reimburse me for this friv- frivolous, I can't even say the word right, frivolous lawsuit that I had nothing to do with? And they got, we got a forensic uh, person to go through my emails, and I said this wrong on Shannon's show. They couldn't even find the email. They went through every email I ever sent. And this guy said he sent it in 2015. Like, I remember an email from 2015. And I was just like, that, I mean, that's the biggest problem I got with the judicial system was there's no validity to this guy's case. There's no, uh, there's just nothing. He just threw my name out there thinking, I don't know. He probably thought I wouldn't fight it or it would go away or he would have, could have got a little money out of me. I don't know why my name got thrown in this. And it's just a sad state that we got people out there that could just throw your name out with absolutely no validity to it. And at the end, I got to fight it. Yeah. So I don't have no problem telling them how much money I spent. $110,000 in attorney fees over two and a half years. Because every time he would lose, he'd appeal. He'd come back and appeal it. And then the judge throw that out. But you got to realize every time he appeals, it costs me money. Because then my lawyer's got to actually go back to court and fight the appeal. So they'd be like, yeah, um, they can't find anything. You're good. And they'd be like, he's appealing it. I'd be like. You got to be shitting me because every time he appeals, I'm fucked. <laughs> it's like, so every time this guy, Joe Curley, would appeal something, like, I would call my manager. I go, she's like, that's good, though. You're fine. And I was like, yeah, but you don't realize. Now my attorney's got to send emails and make phone calls and file these different papers. And I'm getting charged the whole time. You say hi to an attorney. It's $100. Hey, how's, how's it going? What are you doing for lunch? $100. So... <laughs> These, that's the problem with these lawsuits, man. I'm like, God. It, it, and the fact that I'm not even in the movie. That's the part that kills me. And I auditioned for it. I was like, no no executive producer credit? No nothing? There's absolutely not one shred of paperwork that says I'm a part of this movie. I sent something to Will or Paramount or anybody else. There's nothing. A forensic email person, a person that that's their job is to find shit in your emails, could not find this email. Had no proof that I opened it, sent it, it got sent to me, absolutely nothing. Couldn't even find it. It's basically this guy just said, yeah, I I emailed Gary, I gave him the idea, he sent it to Will Packer who sent it to Paramount and that's how the movie got made. It's, it's it's like he's in a bar telling that story, and I'm out. I was like, and it, the, yeah, it just it burns my ass. So now I can talk about it. So yeah, be careful of that guy. I want to cuss him out, but I I still want to hold out a little hope that I'll be able to get reimbursed. Paramount Pictures, can you help me out a little bit? Something. Uh, so we'll see what happens. I doubt it. But we'll see. And then uh, it's funny. This it, it, next thing is twofold. It's like I felt like on the Shay interview, I didn't get into my my stepdad a lot or my family because Pete. The one thing I learned is there's a lot of quite a, there's a lot of toxic people out there, you know. And I'm probably am I toxic? I don't know. But what I definitely learned on the messages I got in comments. And like I said, I hate it when people say, I don't read the comments. We all read them. We're bored. Doesn't mean you have to take them to heart. Doesn't mean you have to really make that affect your day-to-day life. But I read them for shits and giggles. One thing I've learned is 
there's some miserable women out there because when when the fact that I've been like I haven't seen my kids and I want to see them and there's all these women saying, "Well, when you cheat, that's what happens. That's the consequences." I was thinking, so every guy that we know that ever had an affair or slept with is a piece of shit dad? Because let me tell you something. There's not too many wholesome <laughs> parents out there. <laughs> so just I was like, and it's all, it was always women. It was always women or gay men. Women or gay men. It was the only two people that was like, that's what you get. That's what you get. You lay around with these women. You don't get to see your kids. They see that. I'm like this. I'm like, God, you guys are miserable people. Just toxic. But one thing that I, I and I didn't realize it till I did the, uh, till I did um, Shan Sarge's podcast. One thing I did not realize was I have, I have no relationship with my mom, my dad, my stepdad my siblings or my kids. And I'm going, dang. I, I even asked my manager, I go, am I doing something wrong here? Is it like, is it me? Uh, am I the common denominator in all this? Because I would say from the outside looking in, it would look like I would be. And my manager said, no, when you, when you can come clean and you start to heal yourself, so to speak, the people that aren't good for you in your lives, they kind of drop off. Which I'm not putting on my kids or anything, but I'm saying like my mom and my dad and things like that. And I was like, oh, because you know I don't have I don't have any contact with. Well, one brother passed away, but uh, my other brothers and sisters, one sister um, were my stepsister. We're we're cordial and everything. She's kind of stayed clear of the fray. Uh, so we we still have a a, a decent. I should see her more. Uh, but we have a, we have a decent relationship. And then I had another family member reach out this week and I'm sure it's cause they saw the, the interview. Um, so I had another, another sibling reach out and said, we should talk. So, you know, there was a, like silver lining through all this. So I think if you watched the interview and heard my side of things, you might, you might think I'm a liar. You could think, uh, I'm trying to get sympathy or you could just look at it at face value and be like, guys, just telling a story from his side of things. I'm sure other people that I talked about in there, they have their side of things, but I was just telling my side of things and I'm not saying I handle things perfectly. I'm not saying I'm handle things correctly in every situation. Uh, but I was just telling what did happen from how I saw things is all I was talking about. In the Shannon Sharp interview, you look back you're like, yeah, I probably could have did that different. Probably could have did that different. Uh, as as I rewatched it, I go, yeah. But like, even even when I talked about my mom, somebody I saw somebody was getting on Shannon about his transitions were off. Like, uh, I, they, God, Gary just opened up about his mom, his brother at the cemetery, his mom yelling at him, and then Shannon said, "So what? Uh, you like black women?" <laughs> Even I called him out. I was like, what a transition. But uh, I feel like when it comes to my mom uh, and my stepdad, and this is just being 100% blunt, I feel like they can't, there's no way they can look at themselves in the mirror and really face themselves. It would be a hard thing to do. They would have to go through years of therapy, years of almost unwiring themselves from how they're wired because the, 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 just the shit that they've done and continue to do, it's so unhealthy and toxic. So, so I got the one brother passed away. So my other brother, he, uh. He just wasn't wasn't a good dude. Uh, he, I mean, the uh, police record a mile long, in and out of jail, uh, and just not good crimes like like robbing people. It, it, I'll t I'll tell you one instance that just I was I was blown away by how this all transpired. So 
this lady messaged me on Facebook and asked me, am I I'm not going to give his name out? My, am I so-and-so's brother? And I messaged her back. Yeah. And then she was like, cause I have a fan page on Facebook and then I have a friend's page and my friend's page is pretty much people I grew up with. Uh, it's almost like a class reunion page almost. And so I would say, I think I got like less than 2000 people on my friend's page. And I bet you 1500 of them are from Southern Ohio. And so lady messaged me and I said, yeah, that's my brother. And then she goes, okay. Uh, I think he robbed my house and I don't answer. She sends me the ring cam security camera and it's my brother and this other guy and they were stealing catalytic converters. So her cars were parked in the garage and you could see them coming in. And this is in the, during the pandemic. So their face is covered up. So, but you know, when it's a family member. So I'm looking at it going, ah, oh, yeah, that, that kind of looks like him. I'm not telling her that. And literally I said, look, that's my brother. You were right. That's my brother. I said, I can't tell you hundred percent. That's him. I'm very sorry this happened to you. Um, and we, I, I said a couple other things, you know, I, can, I don't know word for word, but then she sent me back probably 30 seconds later after I respond, she sends me the bolo, be on the lookout for from the police department. And it's my brother and this other guy. And what made this so sad about the whole story was the mom that reached out, uh, her daughter had some like terminal brain cancer and they, she lived in Ohio and they were flying to Houston to go to have this surgery and go to the children's hospital out here. And the local news did a big story on the send off. Her daughter's getting sent off and all this stuff. And, and I was like, Oh my God, that means, that means my brother saw the news thing and him and this guy knows nobody's going to be home and they went and robbed them. And I was like, it was a girl that had terminal brain cancer. I was like, and the, the little girl that passing away. So I'm now I'm back and forth with the, the mom and we're, I was like, how you doing? How's she doing? Where are you staying? And shouts out to a couple restaurants. One was a Turkey leg hut in Houston, another one. So I start calling people that I knew in the Houston area and I got different restaurants to come and bring, bring the family food at the hotel they were staying at and just, um, you know, try to help out, got, got them some gift cards and stuff. And I remember thinking, God, my life's so, my life's so, uh, interesting that my brother robs a family and then I end up feeding them. It, life's interesting. I was like, what? what? And, and the mom was so like, Anna, like Gary, it, I wasn't, I wasn't coming at you to like, that's your brother. Get a hold of him. Get him for me. I wasn't coming at you like anything. She goes, I just was trying to confirm that that's your brother because people were telling me that. Because like I said, where I grew up, it's small. It's small. Everybody knows everybody. The same, the same police officers went to high school with the people they're arrested. It's just however you decide to live your life as an adult. It's, it's, it's yeah. So it. That was my brother in a nutshell. Fast forward a couple of years ago, I'm in Hawaii. Uh, I get a phone call from a, a relative and said, my brother, they found, they found him in a car. He took some medicine. He was half frozen. I guess he, I guess he fell asleep and they said they, they caught him and he was frozen and they don't think he's going to make it. And I go, it sounded so weird to me. I was like, wait, wait, wait. my brother was found in a car and it was winter time and he took some medicine that knocked him out and he, they, they found him almost froze to death. I thought that was such a weird story. I was like, what? Come to find out year later, uh, I'm talking to another family. Like I'm still cool with a lot of my cousins and aunts and uncles. Honestly, I'm, I'm, Cool with most of my aunts and uncles and cousins. It's just my immediate family. My mom, my stepdad, my brothers and sisters and everything. Well, we come to find out that that's not what happened. He got beat up, got literally beat with baseball bats. 
and they just kind of left him, and he was found. And now he's got the brain of like a three-year-old, four-year-old, and he was in a coma. They were talking about taking off life support, but my mom didn't want that to happen. So, and and I could be wrong, but what I what I have come up with in my brain to why why would anybody make up this story? If he got beat up with baseball bats and they found him on the the, the grocery uh, whatever uh, parking lot, uh, why make up a story? And then it hit me and go, oh my god. The way my mom thinks is my brother Dallas went into rehab. I told, I t- I tried to explain to her, like, when he gets out, we got to get him to a rehab facility. Uh, for When he gets out of, I'm sorry, when he gets out of the rehab facility, we have to get him out of town. He's got to be in a different city, doesn't know what he's going to do. And like I said, we were, I was going to go to Phoenix with him. I got him set up with a job. And then my mom nixed it and I ended up falling back. Uh, so... I'm sure at no fault of her own, because my mom did everything she thought she could do to save my brother Dallas's life, and it just didn't work out. Um, I'm sure that probably still eats at her. It would eat at me. It eats at me still that I didn't do enough for Dallas as his brother. You know, I mean, that's just the guilt comes in, even though at the end of the day, it's nobody's fault but my brother's. Um, so now, fast forward to Kyle. No, I just said his name, not his last name, but my brother Kyle. So we fast forward, and I wouldn't ever allow, allow him over my house. I wouldn't. I didn't want him to know where I lived. Every time my mom would come visit, I'd be like, is he coming? Because I was like, I'll meet you somewhere. And she would get really upset with me because she was like, you know, they, they do the whole, you know, it's your brother, it's blood. And, da, 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 da. and I'm like, look, I'm hearing stories that he's robbing people. He's robbing drug dealers, ripping them off. And I go, I just can't have anybody retaliating against him why he's with me and my kids. So I was protecting my own family in that instance. Uh, so that also, so when he got beat up with the baseball bats and they found him, uh, I'm sure my mom made up the story because she was like, I don't want – I don't want Gary to be quote unquote right again. I'm sure that's why she made up this crazy story how he took some cough medicine and it knocked him out and they found him in the car half frozen to death. I was like, that's just that was the weirdest story when I heard it. And then but when I, when I finally found out the truth, I was like, oh, that makes more sense. It also makes sense when my mom made up that story. Because it's almost like she almost has to work it out in her brain, um, these things. And I, honestly, I, I kind of see it. I see where she, why she's doing it for her own sanity, for her own uh, – uh, Just it, it, it would just be tough to look yourself in the mirror thinking, oh, my God, I didn't, I didn't listen with Dallas. And the whole time I'm, I'm fighting with Gary over my other brother – uh, over why he can't come around, and this is why. That is the exact reason why I couldn't have him come around. Because I knew, man, the, the messages I got about him, oh, geez. It start, and it started early. He was like 17, just like doing, I don't know, just robbing the wrong group of people and splitting town. And then when things cool off, he'd come back, and then he'd go to jail, and then he'd get out. And I'd hear the story. He's doing good. He's doing good. And I remember, I remember one time he got a house, and he was renting it. And I asked my mom. I said, "How's how's he afford a house like that?" She goes, "I don't know." And I was like, "Mom, you know, you just don't want to know." And she goes, "No, I don't know." I go, "Mom, you know, he doesn't have a job. How's, how's he how's he got this house? It wasn't nothing crazy. It was a decent house, but I was like, so, you know, so I would just." Uh, it just got me thinking about everything since the interview and watching it. Like, man, I really, my dad, my mom, my stepdad, my brothers, sisters, and and now my kids, nobody's talking to me. And I'm going, and I, I just don't think if you ask other people, and maybe people, other people, you can ask them. I don't think I, I, I don't think I'm an asshole. I don't think I treat people bad. I don't. 
I don't think I'm just a dick. No one wants to be around. Sometimes I feel like, I'll just speak for my parents. I feel like, I don't, they got, they, they got to almost blame me for how the relationship turned out. And that's why I think I fight so hard for my kids to have this relationship. And I'm, I'm quick not to say, you know, well, 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 if you then I'm gonna do me and da, 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 because that's what, that's what my dad said to me. So I was like, I don't want to do that. And then, you know, with my mom's a whole different story. That's just, there's a lot of mental stuff going on there that I, I don't even know how to unpack at this point, but, um, uh, yeah, and, and okay, so that's that's enough about that. So the big other, the, the big topic, I'll do a Shannon Sharp transition right now. The other topic that I read about all week was this father. He gets on TikTok and Instagram. I saw it on both platforms, where his daughter was being bullied. So then he beat up the bully's dad because of school and nobody else was doing anything about it. And I was like, the big thing was, was he right? Was he wrong? Let me let me get the right. It, and it was it was like a seven year old, I think. Father, bully, beat up, uh, dad viral. Okay. Woo! Dad goes viral after many. He jumped the father of his daughter's alleged video. A daddy's going viral on social media after sharing how he responded to his daughter's alleged bully. Um, KV, K-A-V-I, as he's listed on TikTok, explained there were multiple attempts on his behalf to end the bullying. After the bullying continued, he put his paws on the bully's dad to teach his daughter a lesson about consequences. Kavi said he tapped his brothers to help. He tapped his brothers to help with the beatdown. To this, this is a quote, to the seven-year-old girl who had to watch me and my brothers jump her daddy at school, I'm sorry. I know that was probably a traumatizing experience for you, but we kept asking you to stop bullying my daughter and you wouldn't listen, the dad said in his viral TikTok video. As the 30-second video continued, Cavi shared that he tried to end the bullying in other ways before resorting to a fight. He allegedly sent letters home and had a meeting with the girl and her parents still the child allegedly wouldn't listen. So now you know your actions have consequences. And since you're too young to receive those consequences, you had to watch your daddy take those consequences. Get some therapy. You'll be all right. I'm like, in just 19 hours, the TikTok video pulled in nearly 12 million views and more than 28,000 comments on the platform. Mixture of approval and disapproval, relatable stories, and people key keying over the incident and KB's explanation of it. Uh, some of the... Some of the comments are funny, actually. Uh, one guy wrote, I approve that. 15 years ago, I went to the father and called him out in front of his son. One-on-one, -on -one, though, but he stepped down and apologized. I told him, I ain't playing to leave my six-year-old boy alone. He stopped. Uh, another person disagreed. I have five kids, and if they got bullied, I made sure that they handled theirs. Parents don't need to be getting involved. Yes, speak to the school, but make sure your kids do what they got to do. Uh my dad used to drag me to whoever was bullying me's house and tell the parents either we fight in the yard or your kids would tell me I thought you were sleeping in the garage for a week. Uh, yeah. Man, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know where I stand on this. Yeah, I think I would have to confront the parents. And when I confront sounds like a very aggressive word, I think I would be definitely addressing the parents and we can go from there. And here's the thing, we always we always think that in the movies and in this video, we think we're gonna go to the bully's parents and beat their ass to prove a point. You always gotta think of the other end, other side of things. What if you go and get your ass whooped? So then you got your daughter getting beat up, but getting bullied, and she saw her dad get beat up. So now you're dealing with PTSD on a whole nother level with your own family. You better know. You're going to win that fight when you go there. And it sounds like this guy who's, who's a big dude, the, the K-A-V-I guy, he's a big dude, but big don't mean you can fight. Uh, we've seen that. But he got his brothers to help him. 
So I was like, he was making sure uh, he wasn't losing this fight. But I'm, I don't, you don't do it in front of the kids, for one. Uh, I don't, honestly, I don't know where I stand on this. I see both sides. I don't know what was the conversation like with the dad. Was it civil or what did he come in aggressive? It, it's all about how you deliver the message. It's to have a seven year old and have a dad come over with a seven year old. Like I'm thinking when I grew up, there was a, there was a guy that lived next door to me in the trailer park. And I don't know, man. I remember we, we got in a, we were always fighting at the bus stop. It was one of them things. It was just building over nothing. Probably who's a better wrestler, Hulk Hogan or Jimmy Superfly Snuka, something like that. And I remember this guy just one day we was walking over the bus stop and I just was bagging on him, bagging on him, bagging on him. And he went, kabam, and cold cocked me, black eye, dot at me. And I went, I remember it was cold out, so it, it stung a little bit. I was like, ah, <laughs> I had these big old gloves on and he just hit me and ran. It took, and it was like on a Friday, so we couldn't, I couldn't get to him. But he lives right next door to me. So it ended up, I was staking out that trailer. And he when he finally came out, I finally jumped him, like right on his front porch. And then, you know, I hit him a couple times. But really, I was holding him down, just talking smack to him and stuff. So anyways, what happened was his dad or stepdad came over to our trailer that night afterwards and was like, hey, we got to stop this. We're neighbors and stuff like that. And me and the guy ended up being pretty cool after that. Uh, but it was just, it was, it's just, it's not a big deal. I think any fights that happen before the age of like 11, they're not really fights. I mean, this is, this is bullying. It's one thing. But the bigger issue is, did they go to school? Did they, did they try to get the girls in different classes? Did they just sit the girls down and talk to them? Because... It seems like every fight I had in elementary school, I ended up being friends with the people after the fight. Uh, why don't you, why don't you sit down in the, the principal's office or the teacher sits you down? What's going on? Because normally this, this stuff's happening at recess. And it wasn't a lot, but probably three, three or four times I remember in elementary school, like having like fights at recess or in the hallway. And at the end, I never saw anybody get hurt. Nobody ever got hurt in elementary school off a fight. <laughs> It's just a bunch of people just – it's all these punches being thrown, and then there's no – nobody's got any marks on them. It's the weirdest thing. So I don't know how I feel about this. Uh, uh, yeah, I, what I do know, his daughter is going to look at him like he's the greatest dad ever. He's the savior. But, yeah, you you, you the bully is going to be messed up for a while. There, I don't I, – there's – I don't think – I can't imagine watching your dad just get beat up as a little kid, like seven years old, because you don't really have a memory till you're four. But then I can't imagine what that's going to do to that little kid. Like, you, you that dad fuck, fuck that bully up a little bit in the head. And I don't know if the bully needed it or what the upbringing is like. And sometimes you got to realize these bullies, we don't know what their home life is. There's not too many kids that are just from good homes. It's all loving. It's all happy that go to school and want to bully other people or go to school and want to just start shit. Usually those kids are going through some shit at their house. So let's try to keep that in mind as you're talking about beating up a seven-year-old's dad. Maybe that dad deserved that ass whooping, but not in front of the seven-year-old. Uh, so the fight I'm indifferent about, definitely not in front of the kids. At the school. Did other kids see it? I just, yeah, so he was wrong in that. Uh, but it's also your daughter. As a guy, he's got a daughter. You know, you, you the, 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 that male ego, male, I don't know. You just can't imagine anybody doing anything to your daughter. You just want to scorch the earth when something like that happens. So I understand that also. So I'm indifferent, man. I really said a lot of nothing about this whole incident. Yeah, I see that, but I see this. But I see that, but I see this. So I'll just say, definitely was wrong to do it in front of the kids. I don't know what the conversation was before it led to the fight. But the fact that he grabbed his brothers, I was like, oh, he was making sure this is going to happen. Did he blindside the guy? 
Did he come up from behind him? Did they talk shit first back and forth? Uh, one thing I was like, this, 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 this dad and the daughter can't go to our school no more. Uh, you can't risk that. I don't, honestly, I don't want that guy in any school district I'm in. Good Lord. And what's the level of bullying? Like, where do you put a like stamp on it? Like that's enough bullying. He, they called my little girl fat or they said she was ugly. Is that the bullying or was there physical abuse or what was it? Or was your daughter lying? Was she just making shit up? She maybe she was the bully. She got it worse. We was bagging. I remember one time a guy, I was at lunch, and we was we was bagging. We was going back and forth, and I started killing him, killing him. And then he he sucker punched me in the hallway as soon as the bell rang. I was like, I've been sucker punched three times in my life. One in Detroit as an adult. I've talked about that. One in fifth grade when me and my next door neighbor in the trailer park he sucker punched me, and then this time. The third time, and that 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 time, I think it was in eighth grade or seventh grade, and that was nothing. He hit me, and he the bell rang, and nothing happened there either. But it was like he got mad because we were. It was a group of us. It was study hall. A group of us was just bagging on each other. Boom, 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 and then I hit him, and I hit him again, and everybody started laughing. And he literally like he he told me he goes, Dude, I'm gonna like I'm gonna knock you out. When the bell rings, I'm like, you ain't knocking out shit. I'm still talking shit. But he went for it. <laughs> it was so fast, too, because I had the books. I, I remember I had my books in my hand, and I turned around, and once it was almost like WWE to me, it was wrestling. Because I remember when I turned around, I'm like, hey, man, you know, I'm just bullshitting. It was like, ka <laughs> I was like, do you really hit me, bitch? <laughs> I remember thinking, I was just in, in class yeah, after study hall, before you got let out to get on the buses, you had to go back to your homeroom class. I remember I was sitting in the homeroom like, did that dude just hit me in the face? It's very surreal when you get sucker punched or get beat up. Like you, when you replay it in your brain, it's like it happened to somebody else. And that's how I felt in real time. I go, he just hit me. <laughs> I was just like, and I remember I, that happened on a Friday. Why am I keep getting sucker punched on a Friday? But when I came to school Monday, I didn't sit at the table anymore in study hall. I just sat in another area of study hall. I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I, I want to I wanna be with people that I can talk shit and they talk shit back. And it's over. They're not going to take a person when they lose the the shit-talking incident. So, yes, I don't know how I feel about that. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I said a bunch of nothing about the Akavi. One thing I, I do think, we can't have him at the school. You are expelled from school grounds. Uh, can't be doing that. Uh, and so, yeah, I think he was wrong. I think he was wrong. You don't beat up somebody's dad. I'm going to go with that route. Yeah. As a father... I understand his frustration. I understand. It's kind of like when Kev got tried to get on the uh, the stage for the Super Bowl. I was like, "What are you doing, Kev? It's, it's the Eagles won. It's not your day. You had nothing to do with the team." But I understood where he was coming from. I was like, "Because the Bengals ever won, I said I'm gonna try to get on the stage." So even though it's wrong, I understand. So even with this dad, you're completely wrong. Uh, you shouldn't have did it. I'm not siding with the bullies that because I don't know him. You shouldn't have did that. But I understand, especially when it's your daughter. So, yeah. yeah we just, we're just going to call this episode a bunch of nothing about nothing because I didn't I didn't solve any world problems today. All right, y'all. Uh, Jacksonville, this weekend we got shows left for Sunday. Next week, Addison, Texas. And, uh, oh, oh, I just got added to two Martin Lawrence dates too. I don't want to forget this. Martin Lawrence is going back on tour, and they called me. And I'm doing August 2nd with Martin. August 2nd, we're doing Pittsburgh together. August 3rd, me and Martin's doing Cleveland. And August 10th, we're doing Biloxi, Mississippi. Go to GaryOwen.live for all my tour dates. But, yeah, I'm excited. Martin called, and I'm going to do three dates with him. So, yeah, that's not until August, though. Neither here nor there. All right, y'all. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. See you all next week.